Hello everyone, this is part three of my series debunking the false claims made in this video by Subor and the Muslim Lantern. Homology is the idea that the similarities between creatures in anatomy are due to common descent. The unity of um, anatomy is evidence of common ancestor. The more similar the creatures are, the closer they are, are in relation. This is an adequate description of homology, which is when similarity is due to shared ancestry. It should be contrasted with homoplasy, which is when a feature has been gained or lost independently in separate lineages over the course of evolution. Ma marsupials and plac uh, placentals. This Can you is, explain uh, to the people the difference between the two? Okay, so you have two different types of mammals here, and mm -hmm. these are geographically distinct, right? Mm -hmm. you, you get some in uh, remote parts of the world which are completely unrelated to the others yet they have similarities in terms of their traits and anatomical features which to the to the untrained eye you would say these two creatures are related but it's actually according to them independent convergent evolution it's mm -hmm. not actually due to common ancestry and that totally smashes this idea that similarities are due to common descent. They are not completely unrelated to each other, as Sir Paul says, as they are all mammals. This means they share characteristics that are defining for mammals. In order to make sense of what they've said, I need to explain further into homology and homoplasy. Species can be grouped together according to major characteristics. This is a cladogram. It shows how species are grouped according to the most traits. The most parsimonious explanation is a common ancestor, as separate evolution of each of these traits is much more unlikely. As evolution occurs, the branches split off. One line led to insects, the other line developed vertebrae or backbones. This line that developed vertebrae then split into two further lines, one that became fish and one that gave rise to tetrapods. These are four-limbed animals. This line then split into two. One line gave rise to amphibians, the other line developed into bearing amniotic eggs. This line then split into two. One line gave rise to birds, the other developed hair. This line then split into two. One line gave rise to the prosimians, the other line became bipedal and led to humans. If we follow this line of reasoning, we can see how lines split during evolution, leading to a common ancestor of mammals, which then further split into monotremes, marsupials and placental mammals. The question is whether similar structures are due to common descent, as shown just now, or whether it is due to separate evolution in separate lineages, as in homoplasy. Before molecular data, Evolutionary biologists looked for the most parsimonious explanation to determine if something was homology or homoplasy. The step with the fewest number of mutations would be the most likely case. For example, it is far more likely that horses and donkeys evolved from a common ancestor than for all their similarities to have evolved separately. Similarly, cetaceans such as dolphins and whales have characteristics that place them close to land mammals, especially the hippopotamus. This is despite their visual appearance, which led ancient people to include them with fish. A common example of homoplasy and convergent evolution is wings. Birds and bats use different sets of digits to spread out the wing, and the wings of birds, bats and insects are all made out of different material. If all wings evolved from a common ancestor, then that would mean that there are characteristics that birds and bats and insects have with other species that would have arisen not from common ancestry, but that would be from homoplasy. This would be much more statistically unlikely and would contradict the fossil record. We can now use DNA to conclusively decide the relationship between species and what structures are homology or homoplasy. So no sabor. This does not, as you phrase it, smash the idea that similarities are due to common descent. We can use various methods, but especially the DNA analysis, 
to confirm that some similarities are due to common descent. You might be wondering why Sabor Ahmed and the Muslim Lantern are making such a big fuss over homology versus homoplasy or common descent versus convergent evolution. Why was this explanation that I have given necessary? The reason is because of their religion, Subur Ahmed and the Muslim Lantern cannot accept human chimp common ancestry, despite the overwhelming evidence. They want to portray similarities between humans and chimps as not from a common ancestor but from separate origins. They will accept that mice and rats have a common ancestor. They will not accept humans and chimps having a common ancestor, even though the number of genetic differences between humans and chimps is 10 times smaller than that between mice and rats. I will link this article in the description. Unfortunately for Sabor Ahmed and the Muslim Lantern, human chimp common ancestry is proven beyond reasonable doubt. We said similarities are due to common distance. We've got the re this research from nature showing you how they separated 160 million years ago, uh, those two types of, of animals, and that they're not uh, uh, closely related because they separated a long time ago. This is the article in his slide. Current understanding is that marsupials diverged from placental mammals 180 million years ago. The rest of his statement makes no sense. Closely related and long time ago are relative terms. We are more closely related to other apes because we diverged from them much more recently, but we are less so related to fish because we diverged from them much longer ago. Okay, so the question is why are they homologous? They cannot find an explanation, so they make up a new thing, they call it conversion evolution. We've got a solution now. The answer to that question is actually, it's not just, just similarities are due to common distance, but some animals, because of the environment, they will evolve to look like other animals, even though they're not from common ancestry. So which one is it? Are similarities due to common descent, or are animals based on their environment looking the same as other animals because the environment shaped them to be this way? If, if you have understood what I've said so far in this video, then you'll already know 10 times as much as these two. We can look at the example of New World vultures, which are found in the Americas, and Old World vultures, which are found in the rest of the world. They are not closely related to each other, but they have similarities due to convergent evolution. As scavenging birds feeding from the carcasses of dead animals, they have both developed a semi-bald head as this reduces the chances of rotting flesh and bacteria getting stuck in their feathers. What about the bats and whales? They're not homologous in, in their anatomy, in their outside structure, and they are from different, uh, from different environments. The conclusion, according to what you said to me, because it's environment or uh, structure that they are closely related, right? Why are they similar according to your own <laughs> testimony? His garbled statement didn't really make much sense, but I will explain why they are similar. This is their classification. Look at where the red arrows are. Bats and whales are both animals. They're both chordates and they're both mammals. As they're both mammals, they share these characteristics. Why are they similar? Why do they have this equilocation system, both of them functioning the same way in th these two different things? One is a land animal, one is a sea animal. They both use echolocation, but it does not function the same way. This is another example of convergent evolution. I will link this article in the description. And we ask the question, why are animals similar to bats? Living in similar environments did not develop the ecosystem. Why is it only the whales that, that do that, while the animals that live around the same environments as the bats, and they are similar to it, did not develop that same echolocation system? Does he really think that only bats and whales use echolocation? I seriously think he needs to start reading more. He then moves on. His penultimate slide just describes bat and whale echolocation and the final slide is a broken link. They got something that we call the, 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 the cichlid fish. Cichlid fish, is, it's a very interesting example. Why? Because it's not just two animals that look alike that you can explain, oh, all are just similar environments. No, no. It's one fish, one animal that produces different species that are exactly identical to the same type of fish in a different lake in a different environment. This is the article to which he is referring in the first reference. 
It describes parallel evolution in cichlid fish in crater lakes. Parallel evolution is the similar development of a trait in distinct species that are not closely related but share a similar original trait in response to similar evolutionary pressure. This is well known in cichlid fish as is their adaptive radiation which created a large number of species. Demonstrating the parallel evolution, different species of cichlid in different lakes that feed the same way develop the same adaptations. That research I'm putting for you here in the, in the Nature magazine, they will say to you, developmental bias and natural selection work together rather than selection being free to transver, uh, transverse over uh, any physical possibility. It is guided along specific routes. My question is guided by who? This is the Nature article to which he is referring. It discusses the role of development in evolution. With regards to the guiding, it is not by a who. The guiding relates to constraints within development. <laughs> who's, who's guiding this natural cell? They, they just put a, a fancy name, parallel evolution, and they, they say to you that it has to be guided, and they don't give you an explanation. The explanation is there in the article you quoted. For anybody who wants to learn more about this, they can look up evolutionary developmental biology and developmental bias. Okay, moving on. They have something called random mutations. What they claim is that mutations are random. This is a whole list here of research showing you how mutations are not random. Let's, let's go through some, some of them, right? Let's go through some of them. Let's go to showing you some of the, how these mutations that they claim to be random are nowhere near being random. Research here published by Nature, okay? 791 citations. You can go into it. It talks to you about the origins of mutations and how they're not uh, uh, random. This is the article in his slide. It is from 1988. It describes how mutations happen. I should explain that random means that which cannot be confidently predicted. To spare you from his incredulous assertions, I'm just going to look at the rest of his articles. This article shows how in a common roadside weed, there are genes that are more protected from mutation than others. These are called essential genes. The third article in his list is this one here from the Institute of Science in Society. It is written by the geneticist Dr. Mei Wan Ho who has been widely criticized for embracing pseudoscience. This institute is on the quack watch list of questionable organizations. Nothing of substance is in this article. Number four on his list of articles is a broken link. The they will claim to you that it's random, I already told you, it's guided. So it's not random mutation. It's not blind natural selection. All of it is guided. It's not random, okay? So in summary, he has looked at articles that show that mutations are not maximally random and that there are some constraints with some areas more prone to mutation than others and he has interpreted this as thinking that mutations are not random. This shows a lack of understanding on his part. I suggest the viewer watch these two excellent and easy to understand videos by John Perry on the topic of non-random mutations. I will link them in the description. They next discuss a video by Dennis Noble. Dennis Noble is a renowned physiologist, but his opinions on evolution is widely criticized by evolutionary biologists. Please read his rational wiki page here. Here are responses to his opinion on evolution from evolutionary biologists Jerry Coyne and PZ Myers. I will link them in the description. So there is no such thing as random mutation. And as I said to you, any idiot comes to you and says to you there's random mutations. He's an idiot who did not study the research. And I put for you already links here. Yeah, You don't believe me? I just put you four, four links. I have looked at your links and I've come to the conclusion that you have a pathetic misunderstanding of evolution and that you have cherry-picked articles which you think supports your case but do not. Furthermore, you have quoted people like Dennis Noble whose opinion has been ridiculed by people who are far more knowledgeable in the area of evolutionary biology and you have ignored people who are better qualified to give an opinion. The question is that, directed by who? Would they ever say directed by God? 
That's an impossibility in the in the scientific field. So what do they say? It's actually directed by cells. In the first research I showed to you here, I said to you by nature, the first one, the claim is actually the cells are smart and intelligent. And at least that's how, you know, prior to their crea creation, they already had these codes of how, of how to be organized. And, and they, uh, they started functioning on them after their creation. What an idiotic thing to say. The articles do not state that the cells are smart and intelligent. They were not created with codes. They evolved and follow processes coded for by their DNA and respond to the environment. Some others you say to you, it's microbes actually. There is a, and they've invented the new term called microbial intelligence. Let's look at the last two articles on his slide. They do not describe bacterial intelligence in an animal form, but instead demonstrate signaling mechanisms between bacteria and their organization as free-floating or as part of a biofilm. I need to stress that articles often have a catchy clickbait name such as this one in order to attract a reader's attention. It's important not to be too drawn in by the headline but to read the article. These two seem to have not done that and have based their erroneous opinions just by reading the headlines. Let's move into the genes now. Yeah, This research I put here which is by the National Library of, of Medicine, the, the, of Medicine, the Gov. This is another example of how clueless he is. He doesn't know how to read an article. It is not by the National Library of Medicine. That's just where it's stored. The article clearly shows the journal and the authors here. Introduction. Someone says I'm making this up. I'm giving you the reference. Okay. They say that two genes or proteins are homologous if they evolved from a common ancestor. So they say that they are homologous if... We accept the assumption that they evolved from a common ancestor. That's what the book is saying. Okay. Now, when you go un under the same book, there's a section called scoring metrics. The scoring metrics. The scoring metrics that they use in those studies. They say most database searching methods, such as BLAST, BLAT, BLAST, HMMMER, there's many differences, depend in some form on the uh, in, in some form on the evolutionary insight of the Dayhoff model. So they're saying to you the systems that they're using to look for those similarities already assumes the evolution is true. I don't have this textbook, but let's just look at what he has said. HMMER and BLAST are database searching methods. Dayhoff refers to Margaret Dayhoff. She produced a matrix which tracked closely related proteins. The systems do not already assume that evolution is true. They just identify changes. I will link this video from Bioinformatica in the description for anybody wanting more information. There is then a discussion on their misunderstanding of comparative genomics. I will post articles and videos explaining why humans and chimps have 96 to 99% shared DNA. In order to understand why this number varies, Please watch this video, which I've also linked, which describes the difficulties in getting a precise figure for shared DNA. I will end my analysis here and resume in part four. Thank you for watching.